Afternoon, everyone. You might have noticed that my background has changed. I am now at home, and I'm now I'm ready to do structural immunology part four out of five. This is sort of a bonus lecture. Biochemistry one students, I had so much to say for the previous ones that I recorded two hours of material, and that is all I could conscionably give you. However, we will have part five, which will set us up for our tour. I'll give you half an hour off of class at the beginning of class, and I want you to watch that before class. Part five is coming. So I had to cut something, and I had to cut part four. But I already had all these great stories, and they also have to do with how the SARS-CoV-2 responses and drug targets are going. And so I decided to go ahead and do this. Um, I will make a lot of connections to Biochem 1 and 2 in this. So it would be good for you to watch it, but you've got enough to do right now. I'm not going to require it, but I'm going to hope that at some point that you look back on this and say, hey, all that Biochem stuff actually helps me to understand all the things that people are going through to try to get something that will mess up this SARS-CoV-2 virus. The main thing about viruses, and this is a basic of drug design. Viruses are replication machines. They have honed themselves to be nothing but the replication that they need to do. And they're even incomplete without the host cell that they infect. And they take over its transcription and translation machinery to be able to turn themselves into another uh, thousand, ten thousand copies of themselves. They can't do it without our materials without our host cell environment because they are incomplete in themselves. Because of that, they are built to repeat and repeat and repeat. It's like the world's worst earworm. And when they have this biochemical repeating setup, they can't help but repeat themselves. And because of that, because they're relatively simple, they have relatively small genomes, they have relatively few protein production. It's nothing like malaria, which is hugely complex and gives us a lot of things to sort through when we're saying, what can we attack on malaria? With viruses, they're so simple that we can actually have more hope of going after certain things. And they're so simple that they have to repeat themselves. Not only do they have to repeat themselves within a viral strain, but different viruses are going to repeat themselves and look like other different viruses. The whole reason why SARS-CoV-2 is called number two is because SARS-CoV-1 was the SARS that you may have heard about back in 2002, 2003. These are very similar, and we put a lot of research into fighting SARS-CoV-1 that now we can actually just take some of that stuff and we can throw it at SARS-CoV-2, and it actually works, in my view, surprisingly well. The fact that it works at all um, is one of those things that I want people to, to know about. And so here I'm going to go through the many different ways that biochemists are attacking SARS-CoV-2. I'm going to go a little fast. I want to put everything here so that if there's things you have questions about, you can research it. I'll give you the exact paper title so you can like look up that paper. Most of these papers are free online anyways. Here is the viral life cycle from uh, a company called Invivogen. And this, is, uh, this looks like every other viral infection cycle. I don't want you to worry about the details. I want you just to look at how the virus gets into the cell, follow the red arrow, the virus has to attach to the outside of the cell, then the cell takes it in and the virus takes over. The virus takes over and replicates itself inside the cell, it takes over the replication environment of the inside of the host cell. And once it makes tens of thousands more copies of itself, then it leaves through the other part of the red arrow. This is how the viral proteins work. Now, notice at the very top, they show you a structure of the virus. There's only four proteins there to look at, S, N, E, and M. And really, as far as the proteins that are actually in the virus, those are it. They're called the structural proteins for the virus. And when I say that viruses give us just a, a simple number of targets, yeah, that's all the targets that we can have if we're targeting the virus outside the cell. Now, inside the cell, the virus, uh, as part of its takeover program of the whole cell, it replicates its RNA, and the RNA makes a bunch of proteins that exist only inside the cell. Those are also targets. So we have basically 29 proteins that are in the virus in some way, 29 targets 
that we can try to do. The good news, each of these proteins is a defined molecule. We know what its gene sequence is. We may not know everything about how it works, but we can figure out how it works by taking that gene sequence and making it in a lab, doing tests on it, and then testing those tests on real live organisms in real life situations. It's actually really important to realize the difference between finding something in a lab and finding something in the real life environment. There's a big dis distance between those two in many cases. But at the very least, we can read the virus's instruction manual and we can follow it. We can remake these proteins and we can figure out how to gum them up. So here's another uh, view of the four proteins that are in the SARS virus. You have the spike protein, S, envelope protein, M, I mean, envelope protein, E, membrane protein, M, and nucleocapsid protein, N. The nucleocapsid protein is the only thing that is strictly speaking inside the virus. The spike protein, like it sounds like, sticks out outside the virus. That's the thing that you see all the time. The other thing about this is that how does the virus get into the cell? It gets in through a certain door. And so it latches on to, it knocks on the door by latching onto the protein. In this case, the protein is a receptor called ACE2. These five components are what we're going to be talking about for the rest of this. How can we mess this up? Um, the first thing we're going to talk about is how can we mess up the spike protein S. Then we're going to be talking about how can we mess up the proteins that it makes inside the cell. And there are two types of proteins, so that we have three parts to this talk. Now, um, the artist, there's only there's many different ways to show what this. I've already shown you two ways to uh, show what the art, the the virus looks like. Here's four more ways by artists. One of these is one that I've used in my biochemistry classes all the time. It look real familiar to my students. And so um, I got this from Twitter, and you can see here are the four artists credited. I recommend that you follow them, especially David Goodsell. I've been following his work for a really long time. He's the one in the Southwest Quadrant. And we've already seen one of these in the last um, one, so I'm going to show you the other three. Here's a really schematic one, and whenever you see the virus, look for the um, four different proteins. The S sticking out, the N on the inside, and the E and M in the membrane that's in between the S and the N. So here you have a schematic view of COVID-19. Here you have sort of, if Leonardo da Vinci drew COVID-19, what would it look like? It's uh, it's kind of old style. I kind of like this one. I like them all. Um, but you have the S, then the E and the M, then the N on the inside. This is why the S protein, by the way, is what we're going to target. The E, M, and N are on the inside of the virus. The S protein is on the outside. Here's David Goodsell. I love his work. He color codes his molecules, and he spends a lot of time thinking about how it looks. He also liked his work because he shows the molecules as they really are. This is the real relative shapes and sizes of all these molecules. And he shows how crowded and complex the cell environment is. By the way, I showed his stuff before. You can see his antibodies that he's shown out here. You can kind of see his style, right? Um, so you can see all the things. You can see the antibodies attaching onto the virus. You can see how the S protein is actually kind of like a tree. It's not really purple, by the way. He chooses the colors. Nothing really has color at that level. But the S protein, it looks like a tree that's on the outside. E, M, and N are more on the inside. And so, again, the S protein is going to be our first drug target. Here I've taken some slides from a scientist, um, uh, Dr. Zhao, who has uh, spoken, and this comes from an ACS seminar that you can look at online. Here's the information if you want to see the whole thing. Uh, American Chemical Society has some really good materials for this. So I'm going to be showing you some of the figures that she worked up uh, because I think this figure is nice for its color coding as well. This is the entire genome. I've said before, it's 30,000 nucleotides, 30,000 letters. That's all it is. And the way those letters uh, divide up into genes is you have two long open reading frames on the left side of the screen. And those become proteins inside the cell. Those are turned into blue proteins inside the cell. A little more on that later. But the structural proteins that we talked about are shown in red, far on the right. If you look, you see all those red proteins that, that do viral entry. And viral entry is shown with the S protein. So that goes with everything I've been telling you. So this gives us three points of attack. We have the structural proteins, especially the S protein, to go after. 
and then the other proteins, they're actually nicely in general organized for us because it actually puts all its proteases on the um, far left and then it has a bunch of proteins for RNA polymerization and modification. In particular, these come together to make the viral polymerase, which means the viral protein that makes more RNA. Since the virus is, the instructions are made of RNA, this is the printing press for the viral RNA book at the end time. It, this is the real point of replication. So they sort of come in this order in the virus's life cycle. First, you have to enter the cell. Then you have to have proteases that cut up the proteins. And then you have the RNA polymerization. Once you have all these RNA genomes that are made, then the virus sort of self-assembles and you have a whole bunch of virus that now goes out and uh, wreaks havoc, okay? There's another group I want to show you. Uh, just look all the way on the, on the right where you see antagonized human interferon. It might be right above my head. Those are accessory factors. It's a fourth uh, category. And that's really interesting because those are kind of the proteins that sort of counteract our own immune proteins. Uh, human interferon is human immune signaling. So the virus is having some tricks, but these are the least understood. Structural proteins are the easiest to understand because really what it is is a big 3D puzzle. So I'm going to talk mostly about these three, but we're going to mention the accessory proteins once in a while. But these three end up being uh, the three functions of the virus are the three points of attack that we can take. Now biochemistry will tell us how these work and how we can make a chemical that messes up the viral biochemistry. Cell entry, we can block the door, not let it get in the cell. Proteases, we can gum up the scissors. It has to cut itself out. It's like it has a sheet of fabric and it has to have scissors that cut out the different parts from the sheet of fabric. Well, let's gum up the scissors. And then there's the polymerase itself that is basically the thing that makes more and it needs RNA food, it needs nucleotides. So let's feed it bad food and let's not let it make its bad, um, make its bad product for us, okay? I'm going to go through these and I'm going to show you exact examples where there are scientists right now working on this. These are published papers. Not all of them have been peer reviewed, but they passed a sniff test to me and they will almost certainly be mostly validated as we go. So uh, we have more of the information about the, the proteins in the ACS presentation. Uh, it had a lot of good detail about the different protein targets that we have. And they have it uh, like this. You see you have the different protein names on the left. You have the functions in the middle and you have the drug candidates for what drugs can go after these. Many of these drug candidates were developed for other viruses, especially for SARS-CoV-1. But it looks like because SARS-CoV-1 is about 80 to 90% identical in its letters to SARS-CoV-2, a lot of these will probably hopefully work in some way. So you can see you have those drug candidates. If you look at the bottom, they have the ones that block cell entry. We have some drugs that will interfere with the S protein ACE2 interaction. So we'll talk about those first. Second, the two top ones have to do with the proteases. And there are proteases, those are molecular scissors that you can block. And the proteases are similar to other viral proteases. So we have some viral drug candidates, lopinavir and ritonavir, that are able to block those proteases, um, at least for the other virus. And finally, we have the bad nucleotides, which is the polymerase, where we have, and if you notice the drug that goes after the polymerase, remdesivir. You might have heard of that. So based on these drugs, those were... Um, that's what we started off by looking at and seeing, oh, we have these drugs that work for other viruses. Then we have, we sort of cast a wider net, uh, and this table is what she showed in the CAS, um, in the CAS, uh, the, the ACS presentation, that shows the uh, existing drugs with, uh, that, that we could be repurposing from other purposes, like there are other ones. This shows lopinavir and ritonavir again, but also there's an approved drug for HIV infection called darunavir that might be called. By the way, we have the CAS registry number, which means this is a specific license plate that you can use to look up more about any of these. You have um, some other, these are basically the, the an expanded pool of other drugs we might try next 
if the first table was low hanging fruit, this is almost as low hanging fruit because we see how it works against influenza, malaria, Ebola virus. By the way, chloroquine, another one you might have heard of, is uh, we know it works for malaria and we know it messes with um, the, the ACE2 receptor in some way. And that's the idea. But notice that this one is not as direct as some of the other ones. The other ones are, I'm going after this viral protein directly. Chloroquine is more indirect, and that's why some people have questions over whether it's useful or not. So again, these are the ones that can block cell entry. Uh, these are the ones that are protease inhibitors. And then all these in the middle, here's remdesivir, but then there's some other ones. There's, uh, I can't even say this, favipiravir and ribavirin. You notice how these all have names that sound the same. They want them to sound like um, viral polymerase inhibitors, so they want them to sort of sound similar, uh, the companies making them. Uh, the bad nucleotides, these all target the polymerase. And I'm going to show you some possibilities. There's a theme that we're trying because we know how the polymerase works. So let's try different ways to mess it up. And then we can expand the search yet further. Here's a table that she, um, this is actually in an article from ACS Central Science. This is the one that I showed on the second slide that gave us one of our first uh, viral cartoons. But uh, in there, they're talking about, okay, we can look at these drugs chemically. And there's things like the uh, Lipinski's rule of five. These are pharmacological rules, medicinal chemistry type rules where you look at the physical characteristics of a drug and you look for something that has the same shape and the same atoms and charges at the same places. Basically, you're trying to, you have a puzzle piece that works for some cases and you're trying to find similar puzzle pieces. And you do that systematically by looking for these particular chemical characteristics that they share. And that was done and you see that we have a list of things to try that, are, that have similar substances. For example, chloroquine has um, different kinds of chloroquine that might work. They come up in this kind of screen. And if, uh, you know, ribavirin works, then viramidine works uh, is something to try because viramidine chemically looks like a sibling molecule. It looks like the brother or sister of ribavirin. This is all that we're trying. And the nice thing about a lot of these drugs is a lot of them have already passed FDA approval. We already know how they work in humans and we know that they're not terribly toxic because we know we can use them for certain cases. The questions remain about how do they work in this specific situation, but it's really fascinating to look at these. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna quickly go through the three different ways of attacking the, the um, virus. We're going to start with cell entry blocking the front door. And actually, this is the um, something I want to show you a video for. So let's see how this works. The spike protein is um, actually a dynamic, a dynamic collection of atoms. Let's see how this works. And this is from a lab. I cited where the lab was there. This is what it actually looks like. We show you, this is the Harry Potter version where you have the protein actually moving like the Harry Potter newspapers have the pe person actually moving. This is the way the protein actually moves. And notice also that it has these orange parts on it. Let's start that again. It has these orange parts on it that don't always show up on the, uh, on the whole thing of it. So you see that the orange parts are actually sugars that are put on the protein. It's called a glycoprotein and the sugars might be important for fending off the immune system, or they might actually be important to what the protein does, or they might not do much at all. Kind of like hair in itself in, for us. But the main thing I want you to see there is you saw it moving. This is not just, when you see it on paper, you see it like this, you see one frozen place, but it's actually moving. It's got a bunch of atoms. We know where those atoms are. We've like taken a picture of it, but those atoms move around and certain of them are more important to certain bonds than others. There are ones that are important, ones that are not, we can try to guess, but the whole thing about making a drug, we want to go after this structure. And we want to mess it up, not just in a superficial way, but in a way that affects how it works. The first thing we want to look for, this is the spike protein. It interacts with the ACE2 receptor. Okay, where exactly does it interact? Because if they're supposed to come together like this, if we can put something between them, if a drug can bind right here, then they can't come together like that anymore. 
So here's a, um, this is a nice review that I pulled many things from. It shows the spike protein. It also shows the RBD, the receptor binding domain of SARS-CoV-2. And they've already, we're already working at getting structures of exactly where does it bind. We knew pretty much where it binds in general because we know where SARS-CoV-1 binds. And no surprise, it's not got any surprises for us with this. It binds in the same place, but for which atoms are next to which other atoms, that's the kind of thing that a structure like this really gives us. It gives us atomic level detail because we're going, if we want to put together a bunch of atoms that are going to feed their way into that automatically and sort of sit between those two surfaces, we need to know exactly where all the atoms are. So one easy way to do it is, uh, okay, if the, if the virus binds the front door of ACE2, then why don't we just make a bunch of ACE2 and throw it in, except that these will be false doors. These will be doors that don't open into a cell. They're just floating around. I mean, you might imagine Monsters, Inc., except that you, you're supposed to get through one door, right? But the virus is confused because it has thousands of doors flying around and it binds to the wrong one. You see that happening on the right there. This is actually a straightforward way. It has its pros and its cons, but it's a very straightforward way to confuse the virus and to make a drug. Just make more of the receptor and inject it into the patient. Uh, and we can make ACE2 receptor. It's harder to make glycoproteins because it's hard to put the sugars on where they should be, but it's pretty easy to make just a protein. And so we can make proteins in bacteria. And it turns out that those might be able to, to a small extent at least, block the entry just by doing that. That's something I could do with my students because we make recombinant proteins all the time. All recombinant means is you've taken the DNA instructions for the making the protein, you put them into bacteria instead of into a human cell, and then you've let the human cell, or, uh, and you put them in, you let, the, let the bacteria make a bunch more of it for you. There's a lot more to it than that, but I do this all the time. And so I can say it's definitely possible, and this is a plausible way to go after it. And so I want to tell my biochem students, this is the, um, the way that w this recently came out, and they actually did the protein of SARS-CoV-2, so the new virus protein, with the human receptor, the human ACE2 receptor. And so this is a little more complicated than just taking two genes and throwing them into bacteria, but um, they made the receptor recombinantly, they made it in bacteria, and they purified it with biochem. And so for my biochem one students, we talked about size exclusion chromatography. That's how they purified it. They took each fraction and they ran it on a gel. And if you look at their gel, you can say, oh, I see that they've got a large protein that appears to coincide in the gel. They have a you know 100, 120 kilodalton protein that's coming out exactly with the elution volume of that peak. This looks like a normal, straightforward protein purification. They actually showed this in the paper, and you all did this. So then they actually went through and they did a cryo-EM. Again, biochem students, we talked about that technique. And biochem, uh, and they, it actually came out like this. And this is the receptor. This is actually uh, the receptor um, co-expressed with a sort of chaperone protein that is the way it works in real life. And so that's a good thing that they did that. And the thing that you'll notice is that it's symmetric. It's a dimer molecule. And so they, they have all this and we have the actual picture of full length human ACE2. The thing that they notice with cryo-EM, and again, one of the characteristics of cryo-EM is that you can actually um, detect all the different conformations. You're not taking just one snapshot of the molecule. You're detecting whether you're taking like 10,000 snapshots. And they detected in some of the snapshots it was actually in this open configuration. Most of the snapshots, I believe, it was the way it is on the left where the dimer is sort of closed up. You see there's no space between them. Uh, but if you see, look on the right, you see how there is space between them. They're opened up like that. So it looks like this is a flexible molecule. We knew that, but it's nice to see exactly how it flexes because that could tell us exactly how to mess it up. Also tells us about how the virus gets in. Because what they did is they got a structure with the receptor binding domain, the RBD, that's shown in gold. And remember, that's a viral protein, and that's knocking at the door right here. It has to attach. It's a grappling hook. And so you have the viral protein, and you see how it sticks right on the top of both sides of the dimer. You have um, the, the sides of the dimer, by the way, are identical. One of the things that they noticed 
is it looks like this from the side. So go back and forth, look at the part B here and compare it to these. Which one does part B look more like? Does it more, look more like the one in the center or does it look more like one on the left? And when you go back and forth, center or left, and actually it's far left or far right, far left or far right. But if you go back and forth, you can sort of see it looks more like the one all the way on the left. It looks like the closed configuration for the dimer. So that's something interesting right there. The receptor itself moves. When the virus binds, the receptor sort of locks down. If we can mess with that somehow, maybe we can lower binding or something like that. But the main thing is, the most straightforward way to go after this is to look at the interface between the two proteins. And so here's the two proteins. Again, we have the blue human receptor on the bottom. We have the viral domain on the top in gold. And we can zoom in on the surface. And as all biochemists know, proteins are so complex, we don't show all the atoms. We sort of show their skeleton. So this is kind of like the bones of the protein, but then we can take some of the flesh of the protein, some of the other atoms that we don't normally show, and we can show them to show where the bonds are. And you see all those little red dotted lines. Each of those dotted lines looks like it's an important interaction, a bond like a little rope between the virus and the human receptor. Okay, let's go after those. And so they, they go through a lot of these and you can get really into the detail. You see that all the atoms are there. Once you see where all the atoms are, you can start to say, okay, this is a big 3D puzzle. Let's make a piece that fits in right here. And we'll give that to the patient and it will have to automatically fly to where it's going to and fit there as opposed to all the millions of other places it can fit inside the body. So it's still a tall order, but once we have the structure, we can design drugs. Very cool. Basically, now we want to come up. This is another view showing more of the interactions between the, um, the receptor and the viral protein, the RBD. Now we want to have a small molecule that, that can fit into this space and sabotage it. The reason why I use the word sabotage is I'm actually referring to Star Trek VI. I am not sure if this is true or not, but it's true that it's in Star Trek VI this way. They, one of the characters is talking about how they need to sabotage um, the, the, the bad guy's ship. And so, um, and she mentions the word sabotage comes from the uh, Dutch word for shoe, which is sabo. The Dutch, during the Industrial Revolution, the Dutch workers who were displaced by the new machines of the Industrial Revolution were so annoyed with the machines that they took their wooden shoes, their sabo, and they sabotaged the machines by literally cramming the wooden shoe into the gears. It's the same kind of idea of what a drug is going to do. This is a big molecule, it's really dynamic, but in some senses we can reduce it to mechanical type gears. And we can put, the, um, we can put a drug into it like a Dutch shoe into the gears and try to gum up how they work, how they fit together, and therefore how the machine works. It's interesting because, yeah, at one level these are like machines, at another level, they do in some ways follow the living logic that I talked about in part one. That's another topic for another day. But as you get, as you zoom more in, you do get more machine-like until you start to not get more machine-like. This is probably the machine-like level, by the way, of all of life. Um, too much philosophy. But uh, you get the idea. There's uh, a possibility for uh, making a structure that will sabotage this. And so there are other ways to make structures. Maybe we can make up a structure that's not a small molecule drug, but a structure that is a larger molecule protein. There is a program called Foldit. It's actually a bit of a computer game. And Foldit makes protein shapes that fit into other protein shapes. So they turned it from being just a game that would work on whatever uh, the game target was, and they changed the target of the game to make proteins that would fit into this structure. Once we got the structure, they started to do it. They came up with the 99 highest scoring game solutions. You know, you had players who were playing this game and the 99 best scorers solutions, they actually are making those right now and they're testing them against the virus. So again, there's many ways to block the door. You can block it with a protein that fits in or a small molecule that fits in and uh, you can try to do it that way. So remember, but you can't always block the door. When the virus gets in, there's still things that you can mess up. 
the virus has two stages. Uh, there has the stage where it has a long, uh, it has a long RNA, um, R long RNA chain that gets turned into proteins. And because viral proteins have to be really small, basically um, you need they make the proteins all as one big polypeptide, one big chain. And then they have to cut that chain into its pieces. It will not work if the chain is not cut up. It's like when you have one of those models, or like I said, it was like a dress pattern before. You get a bolt of fabric and you have the scissors that cut around the pattern. There are biochemical rules, by the way, that govern how these scissors work. And so um, the thing is, we can go after the scissors. The scissors are also big complicated proteins, but they have particular shapes for their active sites. And we can make uh, like a key that fits into that lock. It's like a complicated lock. And so right here, here's the active site of, a, um, of one of the proteases that's in COVID-19. Here's a, a case where they just found the structure of it as well. And um, if you see it, by the way, biochemists, if you look at this, you have um, a, a peptide that fits in there. You have side chains that fit into little pockets. This looks just like chymotrypsin, which we talked about in Biochem 1 as being an example of one of our proteases that works in our stomach to cut up food. This is a protease that cuts up viral proteins so that then they can fly away and do their bad stuff. So um, that green part right there is the peptide, the part of the viral protein that has to fit into the protease. That's the sharp blade of the scissors in one sense. So let's gum that up rather than make a, um, make a molecule, make it like a key that will fit into that lock that looks like that green thing. And so that's what they did. They have some ways of how they did that. You can, again, biochemists, you can look into the details if you want to. Uh, you want to go after parts of the protein that don't change from virus to virus very much. That's one of the things they're looking through here. And uh, they also, once they were able to make the protein and have the structure, they actually have the, the, these uh, sort of robotic screen equipment that they, ha that they have that will actually throw 10,000 different drugs at it, small molecules at it, and see which of those small molecules fits into the lock. It's kind of like picking a lock by throwing 10,000 keys at it. But it's possible because these are molecular sized locks, for, so they're very small. So it's not like it takes up a whole building. And um, it works actually pretty well. They threw 10,000 things at it, and they ended up with seven good looking hits. Not, not just anything will bind here, but they, uh, seven is, is good. And um, some of them were already approved by FDA or in the midst of clinical trials. You have some information about that down there. The one that appeared to stick the strongest into the protease was um, called Epsilon. And so this is where they, they then took their hits and they did more detailed assays on them to measure exactly how sticky they are. And you, you see that here's a biochemist, by the way, this is just concentration on the x-axis and percent inhibition on the y. You add more of the drug and you see the virus get more inhibited as you move this way on the graph. Um, and these look good. In micromolar affinities for a small molecule, it's uh, not the best, but it looks like it would work if you gave them enough of it. And it's just nice to have something to try for sure. It's something that works in the lab, and now we'll see if it works in the more complicated environments. That's what you can do once you have a crystal structure. Biochemists, by the way, we did homology modeling, and I want to say that people have been busy doing homology modeling, a little more involved than what we did, but not that much more involved and they put these papers up. The only thing about this, I want to show you that this homology modeling took place with a Swiss model search, which is something similar. You might've seen that, you might've used it for our own homology modeling. And um, you can see all these things. This is possible because SARS-CoV-1 is so similar to SARS-CoV-2. You take the SARS-CoV-1 protein and you just make the couple of changes that are in SARS-CoV-2 and you come up with a homology model. But honestly, no one really trusts it. You notice that this might give some people some leads, some th things to think about, but people aren't really citing this paper. But I want to show it to you as something you could do. And in some cases, maybe there will be a case where this would give some useful information. So there's one more way to do it. Once you get past the proteases, you have the virus replicating all the time. And so the viral polymerase is the thing that makes that happen. That's encoded for in the viral genome. We have the structure. 
we need to find out um, exactly where it's all of its atoms are. We need to map out its atoms and then we can see how it works because the one thing about making an RNA genome, you need RNA nucleotides to serve as food for that genome. You take those nucleotides, you string them together, that's what the polymerase does. Then you have a genome, then you have a virus. So this is a, a structure of the polymerase that they've got now. So we've now got all of these things from COVID-19. We've got um, all the different things. And uh, this involves actually one, two, three gene products from that gene that are cut out by the proteases and come together into the functional polymerase. This is the heart of the virus replication. If we can stop this, we can stop the virus from moving on. So this is the structure. This is what it looks like on the DNA. This is at least the, um, the let's see, NSP12 is the gene that's shown at the top. The different colors are different domains. They, fold, they found they folded up like this, and then you have NSP7 and NSP8 that sort of come down from the top to form the complete virus. And so they have that, and it's really cool. Um, and uh, so they look at it, and the, the one thing that they noticed is if you just look at this virus just from this, this polymerase, just from this level, see this beta hairpin, the light blue part down there? They highlight that because that is a new structure in SARS-CoV-2. Homology modeling would find it very hard to find that structure because it's not in the previous structures. But crystal structures, of course, and cryo-EM can definitely find them right away. And so they notice that right away, that you have this big beta hairpin that is um, that might have an effect in what works and the, what fits into this structure. The other thing is, and you see I've sort of faded in and out here, you have um, the RNA fits into the middle of the molecule like this, and the RNA comes in and it goes out by the purple and orange spots. But the really important spot is the blue spot that's coming in, the NTP entry spot. That is the mouth of the, vir of the viral protease. That is where all of, these, um, all of these nucleotides have to stream in. For every letter in the genome, a nucleotide has to enter there and has to be strung together into the uh, RNA genome that way. So that's a door through which a ton of nucleotides must move, just like you have to eat to live. The viral polymerase has to eat, has to pull in, uh, has to pull in nucleotides to be able to do this. And so they looked right there, and I believe from this that they know where remdesivir should bind. They didn't actually see it there, but there's no time for that. Instead, they know where it should bind, they know how it works, and they said, oh, it looks like the remdesivir will bind right in this place right here. And it looks like everything's in order. It looks like, it looks like the shapes are right, that the remdesivir fits. It looks like so sofosbuvir would also fit. And uh, the UDP, by the way, is the nucleotide food that fits there. So they're, they're saying that it all makes sense. It looks like this will block up the mouth of the virus. And so there's another paper. So now that they have this, um, the thing is remdesivir looks like a nucleotide. There are lots of drugs that look like messed up nucleotides. And so let's try them because it looks like this virus being so hungry for food, so hungry for RNA nucleotides, will eat up bad food that we give to it. So for example, here's another paper that's trying another thing that looks like remdesivir. And both of these molecules look like the good food, the cytidine molecule that is shown here. So that's what good food looks like. This paper talks about how they tried this molecule and look back and forth, you can see that molecule just looks like a version of cytidine. It's just a slightly messed up version. In fact, in my view, I'm not sure how bad this bad food is. You see how it's almost exactly the same as the good food. And so I, I wouldn't be surprised if this drug ends up not working not because it's too different, but because it's too much the same. You need to find something that's same enough to fit in, but different enough to plug up the works. This looks like it would fit in. I'm not sure how much it would plug up the works. You might have to add a lot of it. But I want to show right next to it, here's remdesivir. And uh, notice that remdesivir has a similar pattern. It has a nuclei um, type of stuff on the top. This is a different base, by the way, than cytidine, but it looks like one of the other bases. And you notice a little pentagon in the middle. That's a sugar, and that's an essential part of a nucleotide. 
And it, remdesivir even has a little phosphate down at the bottom, which biochemists will expect to be on any nucleotide. So this is how remdesivir works. This is how this other thing works, and they both look like the cytidine that they have there. Um, we can try other things. We have a lot of nucleoside analogs that look like messed up versions of good RNA food. The problem is these are pretty nonspecific. Every cell in your body needs RNA nucleotides in one way or another, but the virus needs a lot of them. So side effects can come from this. We don't know exactly what's going to work, but we have a fertile field of drugs to try if we want to try a bunch of nucleoside analogs. So that, and that's why I'm fairly positive that remdesivir will indeed work. I'm not sure how well, but it makes sense that there's a nucleoside analog that would work because it's the nature of the virus to repeat itself. And to repeat itself, it needs nucleotides. So let's feed it something that looks like that and trick it. There's a couple more things. So you notice that there's a lot more open reading frames that we didn't talk about. We talked about 29 proteins and we talked about maybe half of them. Those accessory proteins that mess with innate immunity are weird. Um, it, there's a lot of things to figure out with those. Uh, and there's, a, so like here's one about the, um, for the original SARS, SARS-1, ORF9B, that protein, actually suppressed innate immunity. It went through mitochondria and it messed with our innate immune systems. More on innate immunity to come because that's one of the things that I've studied, although it's also a very wide field, definitely. The other thing is, this is the, the thing that I want to put down as I'm interested in. You might have heard that viruses have weird effects, and this is true for all viruses. When they interact with the complex system of the human body, there are going to be some things that they do that we don't anticipate. One of the reports is that things are happening with the blood. There's blood clotting, there's blood problems, there's people on blood thinners that do better, people on uh, whatever the opposite of blood thinners is that do worse. Uh, their strokes and things like that. So it looks like something is going on with the blood. And could the virus be actually targeting a blood protein like hemoglobin? Here's a paper from China, and this has been cited a couple of times. They are looking at the um, ORF10 and ORF3A proteins, and they said they found evidence that it might attack the beta chain of hemoglobin. It might be because the virus is hungry for heme and or iron, that it even can break open hemoglobin and go after the iron. Malaria does that. Um, I'm not quite sure what the relationship is to viral immunity, but it's at least plausible on the surface. I do want to caution you about this. I find this provocative, but then I looked at the paper. How did they do it? They didn't touch water. They didn't go into a wet lab at all, at least from my uh, reading of the paper. They um, did conserved domain analysis, homology modeling, biochemists, notice that, and molecular docking. Those are all computer programs. They did not actually test this in the lab. So this, to me, gives you a basis to test these predictions in the lab. Until I see wet lab data, I'm going to be very skeptical that they know exactly what this does. The other thing we can see is we can see what parts of the virus are mutating. There's a small chance, I still think it's very small, the small chance that we'll have a functional difference in how the virus works from where one of these mutations happens. But remember, 30,000 letters, you need to have a significant, um, most of those letters, you change one of them, the virus doesn't care. If you say that a mutation has happened, then that means you've changed one of these 30,000 letters and all of a sudden you have a new virus. That's like saying if I took a 30,000 character long article and I changed one letter, the entire meaning of the article changed. And we can also accumulate typos over time, you know, and things like that. But remember how small a single mutation is. And remember the rule, just like you need more than a day of data to make conclusions, you need more than one study, more than one mutation, more than one thing in general to have a huge difference to this virus. And honestly, you need more than one good drug lead, more than one vaccine. The good news is, as I've shown you, we have more than one drug lead, we have more than one vaccine. And that brings us to part five. All right, thank you for listening along today. And um, biochemistry students, I will see you soon with part five that you are required to listen to. For those of you who are actually listening to this, high five. And um, I will talk to you soon.